Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled today are producer-director Rollin Binzer and writer Gordon Bresick. Producer-director Rollin Binzer is a man whose many careers has earned him more than 300 awards of excellence, gold medals, and citations. <laughs> Three of his posters are in the permanent collection of MoMA and uh, and at the Smithsonian Institute as well. He's been a guest lecturer at the Chicago Art Institute, at the Harvard Business School, and at MIT School of Visual Language. So let me go through the, cre the creative path of Roland Binzer. He's a cartoonist, animator, designer, art director, ad executive. Are you laughing, Roland? Yes, <laughs> I am. <laughs> author, marketing consultant, and documentary filmmaker. And we have him here today because he made a documentary film called Providence St. Mel. So you started at an early age as a cartoonist, right? When 16 years 16, old? 16, yes. How did you start a company? Well, um, expedient means, I guess. Uh, I uh, was in a situation, actually, where my father was sick. So, in a way, the only thing I could think of to do to make money was do these comic greeting cards. So I went into the greeting card business. Were you reading, were you writing, also writing the... The, the, the joke, yes. Yeah, were yeah you? they were the kind of joke, funny cards, you know, insulting it, humor. It was that, called Card Co? Yes. And it, it, with a K? With a K, yes. And, and, it, and they were sarcastic? What kind of sayings were they? Oh, like, yeah. Want to lose 10 ugly pounds? Oh. Cut off your head. Th those you know? kind of things? <laughs> those kind of things. And yeah. they sold. Yes, they did. It was a successful company. It sold to a big card company. Yes, we sold it to another company. That's and, fantastic. Uh, and I got into doing animation after oh, that. Oh, is that how that happened? Sort of happened? from cartoons. So, so the animation came next, the TV commercials. Did you do TV commercials and, at the ad agency? Uh, lots of them. I've probably done too many commercials in my life. Probably a couple of thousand did television you, commercials. Did you write them? Um, or came up with them? the ideas, sometimes wrote them, sometimes worked with other writers, uh, but mainly directing. And you call them uh, product introductions. I mean, instead of saying like commercials, they're not commercials. What's a product introduction? Is it like oh, fancy? Well, <laughs> product introductions are principally. Uh, you know, where you do the package, the name, the ads, uh, all that kind uh, of thing. Everything. Oh, the whole so introductory program. Oh, know. so it's not just the commercial, I see. No. It's the whole... The whole campaign. Layout. Sort the of, whole campaign, yeah, right. I see, I see. And, and then, um, in 1972, you directed and co-produced this classic concert uh, film, Ladies and Gentlemen. The Rolling Stones. The Rolling yeah. Stones. How'd you get into that? Well, actually, it came from having been in the advertising business, and one of our clients early on was Chess Records oh. in Chicago. Oh. And uh, at a certain point in history, Chess Records was sold, and Marshall Chess, who was the son of the original founder, um, became the Rolling Stones manager. And he and I had been become friends, oh. so he brought me into that situation. It was a wonderful experience. Serendipity. You never know where the next step is going to come oh, from, no. do you? And you shouldn't <laughs> even try to. <laughs> no, <I'm sure. laughs> that's my feeling. Yeah, that's really interesting. So how do, tell us a little bit about that film before we go into the latest film. Tell us about the Rolling Stone film. He had obviously had total access to them. Right. So the, actually they, they financed the film and I worked for them for about two years. 
Was it two years was, making? Yeah, you know, we shot it in a couple of days, but That's it took a year said, and a half to make. But to how, edit. how could you shoot it in a couple of days? Did you do interviews? Well, we Did shot four. Them? We shot four shows, and oh, it I was. Uh, it ended up being strictly a performance film. We didn't do any backstage stuff. We didn't do a lot of audience shots. Oh. Uh, it really just shows them doing what they do that made them famous, you know? And, and, it's, and, and it's still, historically, it's the only film that really captures the whole performances that, that they put on and then what we thought was their, their prime time, you know? We didn't, no one expected they would still be Going till then. Going uh, <laughs> 35 years later, you know. Yeah, so, so you did the, the whole performance. Did you, did you uh, have to um, edit from one performance right. to another? Right, we, we went one song from one show, another song from another show, that kind of thing. Was there any narration in it? No. Nothing, so it was It was really as much as possible to just capure this experience of one of their concerts. You know, so that was a, still amazing. That to was see. in the seventies. Right now, in the two thousands, we have a, a winner. Another film that you've done, which is a, a winner in every festival that it's been in, and it's been in many, many festivals. Uh -huh. The Providence Effect. Um, how did how did that start? Well, that also came out of Chicago, of course. Uh, but you live in Los Angeles. Right, but I <laughs> spent much of my youth living in Chicago. So you have a lot of connections and there. And my old partner from an ad agency, we were partners when we were 25 years old, uh, called me, and he, it was his inspiration and his wife, jo Tom and Julie Hervis, to do the film about this amazing school in Chicago. And it, it is amazing. It's uh, fantastic. So tell us the story. It's Providence St. Mel. Right. And it's what a, does it mean? Providence St. Mel was originally built as a Catholic school. So it was the whole name, Providence. It was the whole, whole name. Then the, in the, about 30 years ago, the archdiocese withdrew its support from the school and wanted to close the school. Oh, I see. The principal, an amazing man named Paul Adams, uh, uh, refused to close the school when the archdiocese pulled the rug out from under him. He was working there, wasn't he? Was he? The principal. As a sec oh, he was the principal, and, uh, I see. He just refused to take it. And he went out in the community, raised money uh, to keep the school going, and eventually bought the building from the Sisters oh, of Providence Rosalind. who owned it. And they it wasn't a gift, but it was almost a gift. It was pretty, uh, pretty good deal. A very, very <laughs> good deal. And uh, for 30 years in a row, 100% of their high school graduates have gone to four-year colleges. It's, no school in America has any record like that. And he stayed there the whole time, He's Paul He's been Adams. there the whole time. Did he help you write the film? Well, this is a film without any narration. But it feels uh, like it was narrated. Well, fortunately, we were able to get the, the people who were living this uh -huh. to tell the story uh -huh. rather than a narrator who's yeah. in, an interpreter. Yeah, that's say. how it feels. It feels like there's, a, there's like a common voice going through, and it could be like Paul Adams' voice, or it could be one of the teacher's voices, but it does tell the story. Well, uh, Paul Adams and Jeanette DiBella, the new president, uh, do a remarkable job. And you know, the school systems across this country are a disaster. How did you, how did you um, shoot? How long did it take you to shoot this film? We shot 30 days. That's it? Yeah. How did the kids Well, it was react? over a longer period of time, but we had actually 30 see, shooting days. I see, but days. it was over how long? A over period? the most of the school year. Oh, just during the school year? Yes. And then you brought alumni back? We brought alumni in. Uh, they were mostly there for a career day, where a lot of alumni come back. And, uh, but the, the film, really, the story is told with the children. Yeah, how did who, they react? Take cameras in the room. The, camera, the children were just amazing. Everything about them was amazing. But they... <laughs> it's in a, it, it started in an area that was totally um, 
like a thrown away area, a drug area, uh, right? It was it's, those it's kids. It's one of the worst neighborhoods in America. I mean, was it the murder rate there, the crime rate, the drug use, the gangs? It's just all over the place. It's, You'd think they wouldn't have a chance, right? And then here's well, this that's school. what's so remarkable <laughs> that they take these children in the most disadvantaged kind of situations. Uh, most of the children are living below the poverty line, and they don't pick the top ones. They take the children off the street, and they turn them into world-class students. And it's you know amazing. why? Because there's a heart and a soul there, first of all. And then the discipline is fantastic. Yes, and the number one thing uh, is that they really care. The, the, stu the, 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 par um, the, the, teachers, no, the teachers, the principal, Paul Adams, Everyone really, really cares. It's almost parental kind of love that they show these children. Well, that's the other thing. You have, or this school has, the total support of the parents. Yes. The parents are there to help. They're when there are parents. When there are parents. But, but so they, there you they, have it. They really uh, demand that of the parents. Yeah. If the parents don't come into the regular meetings, they find the parents. Isn't that fantastic? And, and I mean, it's it like works. Such yeah. concern. Tell us a little bit about the music before we have to leave, because I think it's close to your heart. Well, it is. Uh, my son-in-law is Tom Dumont, who turns out to be the lead guitar player for No Doubt, and he's a, a very schooled musician, and he really has talked to me many times how, in the end, he really wants to do film scores. So, this was so we had an opportunity, and this is his film first score, his first film score, and uh, so that was it's a really great good. Thing too. It's really nice. It this, really affected. That was a wonderful thing. The other thing, um, I'll tell you, it, it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, I sat there, I was totally mesmerized, and it brought tears to my eyes, and I just was thinking of how can't other cities use this as a template? This film? well, what the reason we made the film was to inspire change in the school system. It doesn't have to be the way it is. If these children can come from the background that they have, in the most disadvantaged, poverty, crime, that's street violence they're surrounded with, and they become amazing students. They love learning. The, the class last year, 53 seniors, got four and a half million dollars worth of scholarship. Isn't that fantastic? It's, it's so great. It's so inspiring. And I'm so glad you made this film. Well, I'm really glad that I had the opportunity to do it. It's been a great honor. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part of the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll be right back with Gordon Bresick. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with actor, writer, director Gordon Bresak, who was born and raised in New York City. After a year at Wagner College on Staten Island, he ran away with the circus. Really the circus. John Vaccaro's play House of the Ridiculous. So, was an actor, also an actor at La Mama the American Place Theater, and the theater for New, the New City right. Theater uh, in New York. So your career path took all these uh, different swings. First it was animation, where you won three Emmys. What shows got those Emmys? That was uh, uh, Pinky and the Brain and Animaniacs. And did you also write for Spielberg? Well, Spielberg were? Were, was the uh, the executive producer of those shows, yes. Well, how did you write those things? I mean, where did those ideas come from? Well, uh, there's only, for Pinky and the Brain, it was easy. There's only one idea. It's, uh, he tries to take over the world in every episode. Uh, no, actually, it was uh, lots of different permutations of that. But when, when you started, was writing for animation something new? Because this was like 20... Uh, 25 years ago, right? When I first started doing yeah. that. No, yeah. I, I had done, uh, uh, I had been an actor in New York and then I didn't like the plays I was in so I became a writer 
at, in New York, and then I, I didn't like uh, how my lines were being said, so I became a director in, in New York, and, and then I drove a cab. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I went right that. up. <laughs> yes. And so when I moved out to California um, to uh, hopefully sell films and so forth, my then wife was doing voiceovers, and she got a job oh. on a cartoon show, and I went, hmm, somebody has to write those. Did you figure that out? That's oh, I figured out somebody must that. be writing them, yes. Really? Because so I submitted I a sample to Hanna-Barbera, and I was hired on staff at Hanna-Barbera. Oh, was, was it a new thing? For me? Writing the, no, just that animation, or were always those, those um, early, I guess, what were they, the early... Um, I mean, Hanna Barbara, yeah. Well, no. Traditionally, animation was was not written by script, but when it, television became the basic uh, buyer instead of uh, uh, studios, you know, studios uh, you know, running before the feature film, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny or Woody Woodpecker yeah, cartoon, yeah. Uh, then it became script based, and so uh, That's then what the I a animation writing. Uh, sort of uh, came to be. There are a lot of people who believe that uh, it, sh it shouldn't be written by script, uh, that it should only be storyboarded. And, and there are some shows oh. that are successful doing that, but others that, that like The Simpsons and, and Family Guy and Pinky Those the Brain and Animatics, they're, they're all scripted, yes. Yeah, but I think that you're right because you see a cartoon and you just think it's like a bunch of uh, drawings. Oh, yeah, well, people screen. would ask yeah, me, you know, yeah. I'd say, I write, I write cartoons, and they say, well, what do you write? <laughs> what do you write? Well, there, right. uh, the story, everything <laughs> right. they say and do, and, and uh, it's actually much more complicated than writing for film because we actually write in every camera angle, every shot, oh. every reaction, and so forth, so it's, it's very comprehensive. Well, we keep talking about writing, and you got the first Writers Guild Award. For animation writing, yeah. I mean, yeah. they had never even... Decide, thought about that before. No, there's a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, and a lot of your viewers may not know this, but the writers of the most popular uh, animated features that you can think of in the last few years were not uh, writing those under the protection of the Writers Guild. Oh, that's interesting. And so those of us who are in the Writers Guild and also animation writers have been working within the Guild to try and get more and more of writing represented. Uh, uh, Family Guy and The Simpsons were not originally covered, but we fought to get those things covered. Now it's just, it's on par with live action. Yeah, so now, so I wasn't so far off not thinking that that no. stuff wasn't like that. Did the not circus did did the circus <laughs> help you? You mean John Vaccaro's Playhouse of the yeah, Ridiculous? Yeah, did that help you uh, in writing or well, the I rest think, of your career? I think it did. I think it it helped form my sensibility because the Playhouse of the Ridiculous was an outsider look at everything, it ridiculed, and, and so it certainly gave me a satiric overview. I mean, that's, that's one of the seminal you know, influences on me, but also the Marx Brothers and, and, mm. the, kind, and the kind of, you know... Uh, watching uh, those, you mean? Watching those Well, watching them movies? being influenced by, by that and, and the anarchy of that kind of, of, of stuff I love. But I'm also a big Danny Kaye fan and Bob Hope fan. And and, but, and you also acted in the La Mama, the experimental yeah, theater. Yeah, we did a lot of experimental theater there. and, and you Was know, that, that traveling? Did you travel with that Well, group? yeah, I was, I was with uh, a La Mama troupe and the play has to be ridiculous, touring Europe several times. Okay, and, then and let's stop for a minute because you were arrested for obscene. <laughs> <laughs> for obscenity, <laughs> yes, yes. That's one of my prouder obscene. moments. Yeah. Uh, what? Well, we were in a play. This was the Playhouse of the Ridiculous, and we had been playing it all over Europe. And <laughs> and uh, we were invited to the uh, mayor of Brussels' house for a dinner and a reception. Oh. And uh, we went. And the next day, they they arrested us. Uh, for, after you had for the dinner. Play. After we <laughs> and after the mayor had made a speech about you know. What a one, one, wonderful freedoms they have there that they could allow this and the play. There was no nudity in the play. It was it, just for the words. No, it wasn't oh. even the words. It was, it, it was for the climax of the play, which was literally a climax: <laughs> a giant penis extended over the audience <laughs> and squirted water on them at the end. Was it was uh, it a blow up? Was it a yeah? Rubber? It was a big inflatable uh, <laughs> thing. Actually, it was a wire frame and and you're built around. Did and you take that with you everywhere? Yes, it was actually on top of the bus. 
<laughs> with with a, with covering over that, so people knew when we were coming. Yeah, well, you were coming, right? <laughs> and, and then you said you you had talked to John Vaccaro, and you did a play here in well, LA. Well, yeah, I, I I directed in '95. I directed a play here at the Open Fist Theater called The Moke Eater, written by Ken Bernard. And it's a very very bizarre uh, sort of Twilight Zoney weird piece, and. Um, and I thought it went well and everything, but I, I remember telling John Vaccaro about it afterwards. I said, the difference between your production and my production was you were getting crazy people to act, <laughs> and I was getting people to act crazy. And because, and you know, he had, we had, you know, some real, you know, very, uh, I'd, I'd say, exotic and, and strange people back in the Playhouse back then. Uh, Jackie Curtis, uh, uh, Holly Woodlawn, uh, Ruby Lynn Rayner, uh, you know, lots of people, Mary, Mary Warnoff. Warna, who's uh, not so crazy, but I think she was then. Uh, yeah, she they played were... my mother in a play oh, she... uh, uh, once. Uh, I played an 11-year-old uh, oh, named Buster. Kidding. It was a, a, a play called Big Mother in, in which she beat me with a fly swatter. But, uh, <laughs> those, are the, those were the fun days in New York. Actually, yeah. those were really interesting and very creative. Because um, nobody was uh, uh, concentrating on making money. It was just a... And, you know, I, I, I went back to New York a few years ago to do uh, a play again. And it's so different now because now it isn't young actors and dancers and writers coming to New York to, to learn the ropes. It's young stockbrokers and commodity oh, traders. And, and it's a, just a different atmosphere. Completely. It doesn't feel the same, does no, it? No, no. So... All this animation, all these awards, all this writing, and the TV c career comes to an abrupt end, and theater comes in. Well, it was, it was abrupt, but I mean, there was a physical reason for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, a liver transplant in 2005, and I had been sick for a couple of years before that, so I so really sort whole... of absent myself from the scene to, to get better. And, and by going away, and, or staying away, Things changed, and you came back to theater instead. Well, no, I came. I, I was sort of out of the loop as far as animation uh, went. I also I moved from from L.A. to um, Jacksonville, Florida, to go to the Mayo Clinic there because I had heard oh. that it had the shortest waiting time oh, of any I liver see. center, and uh, and so I, I went there. I left uh, L.A. in June of two thousand four and finally had uh, my transplant in early 2005. And I uh, had been on the list for years here in New York, and I mean in L.A., in and LA. I, was getting, I was getting sicker and sicker. And so I left, and, and you know, so my whole life was like a complete uproar. My marriage ended, and my career in animation seemed, you know, I had a, occasional offers of work, but basically I was out of everybody's thinking. Is that what happens? I mean, yeah. because you were like on the top of the, your game. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So um, it, it, it seems like um, to me that it was abrupt because of how well, certainly, high you were on the certainly ladder. Certainly the, the, the financial end of it was pretty abrupt. I guess. And, so here and, we are yeah. in the theater. Little theater in L.A., which is fantastic and is like the greatest show place. But I don't think there's much money in little theater. Yeah, well, the money, it's like the old joke about Las Vegas. It's the only place where money talks. It says goodbye. It says goodbye. The, 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 the theater is, is also is, the same thing. You but know. you revived this Voidville. What, what is it? Voidville? Well, Voidville, I did that in, in, in New York in, in two years ago, which is, Voidville was a show we had done in 1979 that I wrote and directed then and, and was the master ceremonies. And, it, and then we called it the, the a New Depression Review, the, the, the play that asked the musical question, what's so bad about feeling bad? Oh, right. And, and we, instead of an instead of a, uh, impressionist, we had a depressionist. We just came out and told depressing stories as if they were funny. And Fantastic. the audience laughed anyway. But there you are. So that was like the lead-in to forget about it, Well, I that guess. was Well, that was the one I did back in, two th in, in, in uh, 1979. Then I redid it back in that, New York in 2007. Yeah, right. And then I, you know, I was bit by the bug again. Oh, and, that's how it and, happened. And so, so tell us about Forget About, forget about It. Forget About It. Uh, well, Forget About It is it's probably the, the best example of automatic writing I, could, uh, I can ever uh, relate to you. It's, uh, I went to see uh, an Alan Akeborn play here in L.A., and it was, it was very well done. But in the liner notes, it said that he had written the play 
in six days. Mm -hmm. And I went, geez, I'm, I'm a TV writer. Sometimes I have to write a play in two days, you know? So I said, let's see if I can do that. Really? So that I was sat your down. inspiration? Well, I sat down with absolutely no idea of what I was going to write about or anything, and I started writing a conversation. Oh, that's what this play is, a conversation. Well, it started out that way because oh. there's, a, a, there's actually a prequel. There's a curtain raiser before the main play. I see. And that's what I wrote first. And I wrote it all just in one, you know, it just sort of just came out of me all at once. And it was a cute little thing. And I went, gee, that was fun. Why don't I, you know, see if I Keep can going. do something longer. And, and this other, and it's a play about a male model in New York City who has an accident, loses his memory, and now all of his friends <laughs> are gathering in his loft to tell him stories to help uh, you know, rekindle his memory. And he can't remember and he anything. He can't remember any of these things, and we learn a lot about him uh, through this these stories. This is interesting because everybody connected, everyone in the cast, tells stories about him. Right. So everybody learns different things, right? Right. And, uh, and now not all of the memories that we see in the play are for public consumption. One of them is a private memory, which is only for the person who's saying, no, no, I have no memories. And then we go inside the mind and see the memory that this character is not revealing. One thing, though, I know that you love is the live audience. And so this brings you to the oh, live yeah. audience. Oh, yeah. I mean, I love, I mean, there's nothing, nothing comparing, uh, comparable. Because I know you said that, and when we talked about it before, you said that the live audience makes it. And sometimes I don't think that that happens, but I think the actors react. Oh, it de definitely. I mean, if you could be, you know, uh, backstage or intermission and see when we've had an audience that's really responsive, everybody's excited and up. And Are they? Isn't this great? And yeah. And then sometimes you have a, 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 an audience that is absolutely dead and they do not laugh at anything. Period. That's a problem with comedy. <laughs> You've got to have laughs over there, don't you? Right. If, it, if you're not laughing, it isn't a comedy. And if it's dramatic, it's a yeah. different thing. Well, you know, it's very funny because, you know, Edward Albee said he wrote uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf as a comedy. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's never played as a comedy. But I, I think know. recently they redid it. Uh, he directed it as a comedy. So we thought one night maybe we'd do this play as drama. As drama. And every, too. you know, would say everything really seriously and low key. And see if, you know, maybe that makes it funnier. So forget about it. It's at the Hudson it's Theater. It's the Hudson Backstage oh, Theater. Oh, Backstage, right. Uh, which is a, a, a really nice space. That whole and area is wonderful. And all theater the theaters row, on yeah. Theater Row are great. And Gordon, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for asking me here. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Email jaquinn1 at aol.com and 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. See you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.